I'm Shachar Razani, and in the news, the 38th World Zionist Congress convenes in Jerusalem via Zoom. As we all fondly remember, earlier this year, might seem like forever ago, elections took place for the 38th World Zionist Congress, also known as the Parliament of the Jewish People. We had the pleasure, right here on JBS, to host three days of discussions between the different parties and engage with them on their respective platforms. Last week, it convened via Zoom due to the pandemic. A quick recap for our viewers. The World Zionist Congress convenes once every five years in Jerusalem, or Zoom, and brings together thousands of Zionist activists from around the world. It is meant to represent the entire religious and political spectrum of the Zionist movement worldwide. Together, the delegates and the bodies they form at the Congress influence the policies of Israel's four national institutions, the World Zionist Organization, the Jewish Agency for Israel, Karen Kayemet Israel, KKL, and Karen Hayesod. These are meant to address a variety of issues relevant to Israel and the Jewish people, such as education, diaspora affairs, aliyah promotion, countering anti-Semitism, and much more. Most important to remember is that the World Zionist Congress decides on the allocation of over $1 billion in funding in support of Israel and world Jewry. The current 38th World Zionist Congress has 753 delegates, 521 elected delegates who are selected through elections or by Zionist federations around the world and in Israel, and an additional 232 designated delegates who represent international Zionist organizations such as Hadassah, Naamat, B'nai B'rith, Sephardi Federation, Maccabi, and others. Where do the 521 elected delegates come from? Well, around 200 of them represent Israel. They're assigned per the relative strength of the Zionist parties in the Knesset, elected prior to the Congress. 150 of them are delegates who represent the Zionist movements in the United States, who are elected by the online voting system administered by the American Zionist movement, as mentioned before earlier the year. 169 delegates represent the Zionist movement from around the world and they are elected or selected in the various countries. Last week a mini-drama unfolded as the Likud and religious right tried to box progressive center-left Jews out of influential positions. As a result, legacy Jewish groups such as Hadassah, Naamat, Maccabi and Neighborith International had to step in and finally, a compromise was reached, and a coalition agreement was signed on Thursday evening outlining the incoming leaders of some of the world's largest and most highly funded Zionist institutions. To hear more about all of this, I am pleased to have with me our friend Herbert Block, Executive Director of the American Zionist Movement, AZM. Thank you so much for joining us, Herb. Thank you, Shachar, for having me back on um, to continue the conversation we began before and during the U.S. election for the World Zionist Congress. Well, first of all, Herb, maybe tell us a little bit about what happened last week. Tell us about the drama that unfolded. So last week was a um, unique Zionist Congress. Uh, the first, um, the, it was the 38th World Zionist Congress but um, as many said, it was the first virtual World Zionist Congress. You know, we've talked about, and we talked on the interviews we've done and programs you've done about the uh, Zionist election in America, that we're walking in the footsteps of Herzl. Herzl started the first Zionist Congress in 1897 um, and gathered Jews from around the world, um, including Americans. Uh, there were five Americans there. Uh, this time was unique um, for all of us because um, obviously as Americans, the, the, the delegation that AZM helped organize um, of uh, representatives from different groups in America um, is the largest um, country representation at the Zionist Congress. What was unique about this is that it was a virtual World Zionist Congress. Um, so it's the first time, obviously, because of the pandemic, the Zionist Congress couldn't meet in person as scheduled. Um, 
which presented challenges for people meeting from time zones from Moscow to New Zealand, uh, a dozen time zones and, um, uh, and connecting people around the world. Um, but it also gave a unique opportunity for more people to participate than ever before, more delegates and alternates, uh, many of whom might not have been able to travel to Jerusalem or the alternates who wouldn't have gone otherwise. So there was vast participation of people from America and around the world um, in this very unique um, gathering. So that's Herbert, the first what part. Supposed, what are they supposed to do during those days of the sessions of the Congress? So the Zionist Congress meets every five years or so um, to uh, set the direction um, and pick the, the leadership of what is known as the uh, Mosdot Ilumi, the National Institutions of Israel, which are the four institutions really created by Herzl's system of the Zionist movement, the World Zionist Organization, WZO, the Karen Kayyem at Israel, the KKL Jewish National Fund, the um, Jewish Agency of Israel, Jaffe, also known as the Sochnut, and the Karen Hayasod, which is not so well known in America, but is the fundraising arm uh, for the Zionist movement and Israel institutions around the world. And these national institutions um, are quasi-governmental bodies that act on behalf of the, um, of the Jewish people and the state of Israel um, in, in connecting the Jewish world to Israel, perform many of the functions that were, um, that are, as I said, quasi-governmental things that the government of Israel as a sovereign nation um, um, cannot easily do for the Jewish um, uh, citizens of the world alone um, and, um, and perform functions uh, such as uh, uh, Jew uh, Jewish education, Zionist education, Aliyah, Shlichim that go around the world. No, no. Um, so let me let me just get this straight. They're getting together. They're supposed to decide who does what, kind of like a coalition agreement within the Israeli government and the Knesset to a degree. And but something happened because I don't think you know. I've I've rarely do we hear such headlines coming out of Jerusalem. There was a bit of a drama with the coalition discussion, even though an agreement was signed. So what happened exactly? So let let, let me to put it in context. So the, the, um, the Zionist Congress is somewhat like a political convention, to give an analogy, uh, an American analogy, where you know, the Democratic National Convention or the Republican National Convention, we, we both had them this summer, again, virtually, but they, the, the party faithful meet, they come together from all around the country, all around the world, they get fired up, they hear speeches, they adopt a platform of issues, they elect the leadership. So that's part of the function of the Zionist Congress. Um, but it's also... Uh, an institution based in Israeli traditions and norms, something in a structure created out of Europe uh, by Herzl um, in 1897. So it's following a, um, uh, a European and Israeli parliamentary model, as it were. Um, and the delegates to the Zionist Congress, um, as you explained, who come from all around the world, from 35 countries, um, uh, meet together um, and and they, they both adopt resolutions and, and policy statements, but they also um, have a, what you refer to as a coalition agreement, typically, um, in which the, uh, the key positions um, of the national institutions are, are voted on, but based on a, a, what is usually a, um, an amicable agreement among all the different parties, um, uh, that's the, the coalition agreement. Um, and that agreement gives different viewpoints and uh, different positions in the Zionist movement to different organizations and different parties, ideological, religious streams uh, within the Zionist movement so that everybody is represented at the table. Um, and um, the, un unlike a parliamentary system or the, the Knesset elections where you have a government um, and an opposition, uh, in the Zionist movement, there's no opposition. We're one Zionist movement. And so what, is known, what happens is there's usually what is known as a wall-to-wall -wall agreement, um, where everybody uh, from right to left, center, the different religious movements, uh, the groups that are nonpartisan, everyone uh, comes together in an agreement and, and, and shares in the leadership of the Zionist movement with different roles. And these are not just positions that people want to have a job, but they're, they're positions that have significance in implementing policies of the of the Zionist movement, of the national institutions, both within Israel and for the global Jewish diaspora. 
Um, in the Congress um, that happened last week, um, as reported in the press, um, there was an initial um, uh, agreement put together by uh, what was described as a coalition of the more right-leaning and orthodox groups um, that um, was perceived by um, um, others that they were getting the significant positions and the groups on the center and left um, were, were being shut out of key roles that while they were had uh, other um, uh, positions, they were not the, the, the significant, the most significant ones uh, and as they perceived was most typically done in the past. So there was a bit of a, um, uh, um, a firestorm, at least in the press as well, uh, where the the groups um, on the um, on the center and left and the non orthodox groups said uh, you know that this is not how it was typically done in the past uh, in, in their view um, and that um, um, it it was not usually a winner take all system in the Zionist movement and the coalition agreement needed to be broad the groups on the right and the um, orthodox groups said well we we got the majority of, of votes. Um, in the elections uh, for the de delegates to the Zionist Congress, both in the United States, around the world, including the parties in Israel, as they're all represented in the in the Zionist uh, Congress, and therefore, as you know, we have the greatest votes. We um, have the the right and the ability to have the more significant positions uh, in the movement, and that so, caused so a. Let, uh, me, let me say it undiplomatically, because obviously you have the constraints of your position. The right and the orthodox try to grab, seize power within the World Zionist Congress, but they're unsuccessful. Something happens. Even though they had a strong um, you know, numbers and coalition, they're unable to do so, and they have to change that agreement in a couple of days after discussions and reach a compromise. Bearing in mind that they had the numbers, Herb, why did they have to compromise? What happened? Well, so uh, there's a little bit of inside baseball here on how the Zionist movement works. There is uh, 521 elected delegates from around the world, and the groups that, uh, as you described, had a majority, a slight majority. Um, I think they, they said they had 269 or so votes um, out of the um, 521. Um, but there's another group of delegates from around the world uh, representing Z traditional Zionist institutions, um, such as Hadassah, Witso, Amuna, B'nai B'rith, Na'amat, um, and they um, um, are delegates of the Zionist Congress. Uh, they have the, um, the right to vote of the Zionist Congress, but traditionally, uh, sort of the minhag, the, the, the custom has been that they did not vote because they're nonpartisan humanitarian uh, groups um, and uh, education, social service, healthcare groups, et cetera. And they did not vote on the uh, so, quote unquote political positions. Um, but there was a large, there was an effort by many, um, um, especially in America and, and many of the other diaspora communities to say to those groups that they, they felt that the coalition agreement was not broad and including everybody, um, this first coalition agreement and that um, these, um, inst these organizations should, in fact, exercise the vote that they could um, in order to try to get a uh, broader agreement. Um, so what, what it's perceived that happened was that the, many of those groups weighed in and said, we think there should be a broad agreement uh, that is more inclusive, let's put, say, um, than what was originally put on the table at the beginning of the Congress. Um, and, you know, it, and sort of, you know, put out there that, well, maybe if we don't like, if the agreement isn't broad enough or isn't to our liking, we might just vote in the elections, which we, you know, don't nor normally do. Um, and so the, um, and it was a perception that um, this agreement might, you know, in some way um, uh, be negatively perceived, especially in diaspora communities. Um, and so um, I guess everyone went back to the drawing board, went back to the negotiating table, um, and in the end, the agreement that was uh, hammered out um, was uh, included uh, more uh, representation and more um, uh, significant roles for, for the groups that are in the um, 
what, what we'll call the center left non-orthodox uh, parties. So that, that uh, there was actually a delay in the Zionist Congress uh, voting um, by a number of hours, uh, by a half a day or so. Um, the, or actually, the elections were supposed to take place on Tuesday of the Zionist Congress. They were postponed until um, originally Thursday morning, and then it went into Thursday evening, and it was down to the wire um, of the end of the Congress uh, when this agreement was reached uh, that everybody um, supported. And the end, uh, the vote was you know 520 or so to a dozen um, in support of this agreement because all the parties signed a coalition agreement. So the 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 unity, the wall to wall agreement was achieved. Um, well, with me, changes to what was minute. originally. Um, well, yeah. Let me pause you there for a minute. Um, what do you think would have happened? First of all, realistically speaking, just yes or no. Do you think there was any chance for the right to move forward with this agreement uh, and to ignore the left's pleas or the under the assumption that the um, non-political organizations would have stopped it? So there, there were a lot of um, a lot of um, uh, rumors and discussions going on. Uh, whether there would be an agreement, whether things would just be postponed to give it more time to work out. Uh, there were, there was a possibility that the the group that, as you described, the, the right and the uh, um, uh, parties uh, could have uh, voted in what they had originally had on the table. Um, there was also possibilities that the other groups might have weighed in and blocked it. Um, and, and, and nobody really wanted to have, a, uh, I don't think, a... Um, um, a conflict like that play out, uh, something that hadn't happened before. So I, the, I, all the forces combined really got people back to the table um, and to try to negotiate something that would be more uh, uh, broadly uh, accepted. And, and right. what happened politically that changed uh, this Congress? I mean, we know that, like you mentioned before, there was a wall-to-wall -wall agreement every year. Something happened in the political map of the elections this year. What was it that changed it and made this chaotic reality? Well, I think there was a combination of both, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the vote in Israel for the, the delegates in Israel from the, from the, for the Zionist Congress are rep, uh, reflective of the vote in the Knesset, um, which um, uh, as we know has a, has a, um, a, 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 a let's call it a, a right government. Um, and in the United States, uh, there was increased voting. There was increased voting overall. As you know, in our election, there was double the number of voters um, that um, uh, participated in, in the last Congress and in, and in many decades. However, the, uh, um, the, the numbers of the, uh, while well, everybody gained generally, uh, the numbers of the uh, uh, overall numbers of the parties that were in the Orthodox community and, and on the right uh, went up. Um, uh, in America. So I think a combination of those factors played into, in, into some of this. And let's, uh, uh, let me ask you about the actual work that the national institutions do. We mentioned anti-Semitism, diaspora, um, education, Aliyah, but the truth is that there are other organizations within the state of Israel and across the Jewish world that do just that. So what would you say to those who come to you and claim that this entire thing is nothing more but the job arrangements for politicians and that these organizations are outdated and they should not even be in existence, they should be terminated as the roles are already done by other branches of government and civic society? What would you say to those people, Herb? Well, I, I think that, you know, obviously there's always opportunities to, to um, uh, to reform the way the system is done and to look at things that will be probably done in, in, w within the, this 38th Zionist Congress. Uh, the way the Congress works is that the leadership will be in, in office for five years. And I think there were a lot of uh, calls, including in this Congress, for you know, a fresh look at, at some of the things. But the national institutions perform a vital, in, um, vital and often behind the scenes role. Many of the things that are done with Aliyah, with um, with, with developing the land of Israel, uh, with the, uh, the work of the Karen Kayemet, uh, with supporting uh, um, Zionist and Jewish education around the world, with um, uh, uh, Massah trips, birthright trips, and others are brought, uh, are, are, are the backbone of what's done by the national institutions. So people don't realize how much they may think of as, you know, being done by birthright as being done by an agency supported by the 
by the national institutions, which come out of the, the Zionist Congress. So um, there's a lot of vital work that, you know, in, in the eyes of many people are done by Israel or the state of Israel, but it's really the, the Zionist institutions that are doing it on behalf of Israel and the global Jewish community. So I think there's a vital role to be played. You know, the, the Zionist movement was not just about Herzl's dream to build the state of Israel, which was fulfilled in 48 and then shut down the Zionist movement. Herzl perceived the Zionist movement as um, maintaining the connection and building the connection between global Jewry um, and the state of Israel, the land of Israel, um, and the Hebra Mofet, the exemplary society. That the Zion, one of the goals of the Zionist movement was to make the state of Israel the, uh, the exemplary um, uh, land it should be, to perfect the state, um, to constantly make it uh, better. Um, and so that's one of the roles of the movement um, that we hope will continue. Yeah, we also know that um, the World Zionist Congress is the one entity where you see actual executive roles for diaspora Jewry in managing the affairs of the people and the state. So in that regard, that also plays a, a vital role. But I want to ask you something. We know we live in the uh, COVID-19 era, but we also know that there is another infection in Israel, and that's our chaotic politics uh, within the state of Israel. The uh, uh, election campaigns of the last couple of years and the general chaos that exists even now when it comes to government in Israel. Do you think that the World Zionist Congress got infected by this uh, political chaos? So I, I think that, um, I think as we know, everything in the world seems to be more political, more chaotic, whether it's American elections, what goes on in the U.S. Congress, what goes on in the Knesset, uh, which had, you know, three elections in a year, uh, what goes on around the world politically. Things have all become more contentious and more um, hard fought than they may have been uh, in decades past. So I think in, in light of that global political climate fueled by many things in this uh, crazy pandemic year, the Zionist Congress was, was part of that climate to some degree. Um, I think what also happened is that uh, the Zionist Congress is the first time people didn't meet face to face. So you're trying to put people together and to discuss issues and negotiate and work things out virtually. And as we all know, um, and, and we're conducting this interview, not in the studio face-to-face, -face, but uh, on Zoom, um, things are, um, you know, are different when you're not in person. And that's one of the elements that was really missed in the Zionist Congress, having hundreds of delegates, 700 of them, plus uh, maybe another thousand alternates from around the world, all coming together, meeting, schmoozing, and part of that dialogue, face-to-face -face contact would have made a big difference. There, uh, if there, I you just, have it. there you have it. If there right. is one thing we all miss as Jews is the schmooze. If I, if I can note also that this Congress is unique in that it's not really finished. Uh, the, the, the 38 Zionist Congress session met, but the WZO plans to hold an extraordinary Congress, as they call it, um, um, which is uh, uh, hoped to be held in person in Jerusalem, uh, in the Binyan Ehoma, the convention center, in the fall of 2021, or no later than 2022, depending on COVID conditions and travel restrictions. And, and that's important because we need that opportunity for people to meet. We've heard so many stories about young people and, 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 and others, but especially young delegates and young Zionists who met people from different backgrounds, different countries, different religious streams, different ideo uh, the ideologies, but had a chance to really become friends and engage with each other and understand each other, which happens um, at the coffee bar, in the hallways, over the dinners, um, et cetera. And that's a really an invaluable and intangible uh, important benefit. So we hope that that's gonna happen. Um, and the Zionist Congress, uh, while there were a couple of resolutions that were adopted on fighting uh, BDS and anti-Zionism uh, on campus and promoting Zionist education. Um, we really, there, there are many, many other policy statements of the movement to set the direction for the coming years that were not able to be addressed in this consolidated virtual Congress. And the hope is that that will be taken up next year when, you know, as we say, next year in Jerusalem, um, and it applies not just to Pesach, but to the Zionist movement. And that will be an opportunity for people to meet and really debate issues face to face. 
So that's very good to know that as opposed to other World Zionist Congress sessions, which usually had this meeting and then governing away, this time as a result of various factors, we may have another one in Jerusalem next week, next year, Bezrat Hashem, and God's, uh, everything will be behind us and this will be a, a faraway memory. But uh, in general, what I think is the immediate conclusion is the importance of the vote, right, Herb? That what you mentioned at the beginning of the year when we discussed, you urged people to go out and vote and engage. I think that was a great lesson this time, wasn't it? Right. As, as with everything, you know, the, the vote that was held in America was an important part of what the worldwide allocation of, of, the, of the seats at the Congress. Um, and, uh, you know, people's vote does make a difference. The, the, uh, the votes, um, you know, there, were, there was a new party, uh, Eretz HaKodesh, which got uh, 25 seats um, out of the 152. There were parties that, that went up. There were parties that went down. Um, and um, uh, there were, in fact, you know, five new parties in America, but Eretz HaKodesh uh, made a big splash, as it were, with its uh, a large vote. So people's votes um, make a difference. Um, and in terms of the... the the, the coalitions that can be formed and the agreements that can be reached at the Zionist Congress. So, you know, AZM is the neutral arbiter. We're the board of elections. As it were, we run the Zionist election. We include everybody from across the, the spectrum of views and, and, and ideologies, but it, it, we want people to participate and be engaged. And, that, and it shows that um, as, you know, participation matters um, and involvement matters. Thank you so much for joining us on JBS, Herb. It was a pleasure having you and getting a sneak peek into, especially these days, why voting really matters. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I hope to continue the discussion next year after the next part of the Zionist Congress. So there you have it. Mark Twain said once that if voting made any difference, they would never let us do it. But in fact, it does. And they do. So let's do it. So if you paid attention and understood what at stake, you will remember to make your voice heard. It makes a big difference. Remember, if you will it, it is no dream. To all of our viewers, we say stay safe, stay healthy, and stay happy. I'd like to thank our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's managing director, Dara Golub, technical manager, Michael Paley, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to our wonderful producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. For JBS, I'm Shachar Azani. Until next time, see you soon, and Lehitraot.